Thank you, Pastor Zach. Thank you, Pastor Luke, for being in the sound booth. My guy, coming home from high school camp, brother. Love you. Can we get over Pastor Luke in the sound booth? My man. All right. So, uh, Pastor Austin just alerted me that if you want to give to support uh, Mark and his mission and what's going on, uh, please feel free to give. And when you give, whether it's online or in person, uh, in the giving box just on the back wall of the sanctuary, uh, just mark it, Mark Haney, uh, and we'll make sure to, to bless him with that. Is anybody excited uh, to be in church this morning? I'm excited to be in church. Uh, I'm going to be honest. We went a little too hard at high school camp. Uh, I lost my voice day one. Day one, it was gone. Praise God, we brought a megaphone with us. I was using that the rest of the week just to have normal conversations. Um, So, uh, you know, down in cough drops, drinking warm drinks, trying to get it back for today. Uh, But you can also be praying for me today after second service. I leave to go to Wisconsin because I'm preaching uh, a camp in Wisconsin. Praise God. So pray I have a voice. You know what I'm saying? Like, praise Jesus. Otherwise, I'll be doing a lot of whispering to kids and they'll have a weird experience. You know what I'm saying? Come on, Pastor Jeff, I just want to say thank you for letting me out of my cage today. We're going to get wild, okay? Don't worry, next week I'll be back in my rightful place, all right? Back in the cage, ready to go. This morning, uh, uh, I just want to tell you this. God moved in mighty ways in our students' lives at high school camp. Mighty ways God moved. And let me tell you something. If If you're wondering about the next generation of the church, now they're the now generation of the church. Your students are hungry. Your students want a mighty move of God. Your students want to experience God. Your students want to be uh, 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 challenged more to press into the spirit, to press into the presence, to go deeper than they've ever gone before. I can tell you almost every single student, we took 93 students to high school camp. And on Thursday night, almost every single student from our church was in the auditorium pressing in well past the sermon was over, well past they dismissed until almost 1230 in the morning morning on Friday, our students were there praying with each other, seeking more of God, seeking the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Our church is in a good spot. Our church is in a good spot and our students are ready. They're ready to lead. They're ready to be asked to do stuff. They're ready to serve. Uh, So man, praise God. Can we just praise God for our students this morning? Yes. All right. So this morning we're continuing our series on holiness and uh, we've been talking about pursuing holiness, being people who live a holy life and if you've missed any of our messages, um, they are available on uh, YouTube but we're also making the audio available so you can watch the video on YouTube or you can listen to just the audio only on Spotify, okay? Uh, Spotify, if you don't know what that is, you can come talk to me or Pastor Luke or somebody who's young, Uh, they'll explain that all to you. Pastor Zach, uh, they'll explain all of that to you. Uh, If you wanted to listen to the audio, we are making them available on Spotify. But this morning, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, yes, praise God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 says this, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to, to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. You must be holy because I am holy. If you're a believer in Jesus, if you've chosen to follow him with your life, you've been called to pursue holiness. You must be holy as I, your God, am holy. That's a strong command. That's a strong command because I know myself and inside of myself, (laughs) I ain't holy, okay? And I bet all of us would say that. We recognize that we're broken. We recognize that we're human. We're rec- we recognize that we're imperfect. And this feels like a command that is hard to live up to, that is near impossible to live up to, to be holy like God is holy. But here's what we know about our God. Our God will never give us a command that he doesn't also give us the tools to fulfill. Our God will never give us a command without giving us the tools 
to fulfill them. So what that means is that it's absolutely possible to live a holy life. It is absolutely possible to live a life that is in the world but not of the world. It is absolutely possible to live a life that is set apart and purified for the work of the kingdom. It is absolutely possible to live a life that is dedicated to Jesus but then looks and acts like Jesus. Friends, you and I, we can live holy lives. We can. But the truth is it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Anyone who's followed Jesus for any length of time can attest, it's a hard life. Jesus ain't called us to live an easy life. He called us to live a holy life. That means that we have to make hard decisions. We have to choose to make hard decisions. There will be moments when you will have to choose purity when your flesh doesn't want to choose purity. There will be moments when you have to choose humility, when the world around you is telling you, no, you need to be proud. You need to stand up. You need to puff up your chest. You need to elevate yourself. But Jesus says, I came to serve, uh, excuse me, I came to serve not to be served. Yes, I came to serve not to be served. And we have to choose that same humility. There will be moments where we have to make hard decisions. There will be moments when we have to choose generosity when we'd rather safeguard and keep our wealth and our possessions to ourselves. You know what they're saying on the news? Stock market's not in a great spot. Inflation's all the way up. Isn't it interesting that when inflation goes up, Jesus says your generosity should go up too. Maybe that's a personal conviction. (laughs) But let's be honest. It's a hard life that we've been called to live. You will have to make hard decisions to live a holy life, but hard decisions build character. Hard decisions build character, and an upright and moral character produces outstanding integrity. And here's the truth. A person of integrity is a person that has influence, and that person is the person who's able to lead the people around them to Jesus. We have to be people of integrity. We have to be people of upright character. We have to be people who are holy as God is holy. Church, my challenge to you today is this. We must choose holiness. We must choose holiness over comfort. We must choose holiness over convenience. And we must choose holiness over what feels good in a moment. We must choose holiness. Why? Why do we have to be holy? Because we live in a world that's full of darkness. We live in a world that is hurting. We live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is hopeless, and we need to be people of holiness, people who look and act like Jesus so that we can go into a dark and broken and dying and hurting and hopeless world and be the hands and feet of the Savior who saved us with grace, undeserved grace, and show them grace, undeserved grace, and love beyond love, and show them where we find our hope, and show them where we find our life so that we can take as many to people, um, as many people to heaven with us as possible come on church we must choose to be holy and so this morning as we continue this conversation on pursuing holiness we're going to talk about sacrificing our idols i'm preaching a message called sacrifice the idols we're going to talk about idolatry we're going to talk about what kills idolatry in our lives and in just a few moments I'm going to challenge you to respond to Jesus at this altar and sacrifice your idols. So you did, in that moment, you said, oh, praise God. I can check out of this message. I ain't got no idols. I don't struggle with that. I don't have a, Pastor August, listen, I, I'm not like the Israelites. I haven't built a golden calf. I haven't set up a shrine. I don't intentionally worship anybody or anything else in my life. So this morning, look, I can take a nap. Double naps today, come on, right? Nap in church, nap at home, you know what I'm saying? Idolatry seems like something that isn't a struggle for Christians because we know better than that, right? All of us can quote, Jesus is the only way to the Father. We know that, we understand that. He alone is the only way to heaven. He is God. He alone is Lord. And so we're quick to write off idolatry like it's not something that we could possibly struggle with. Let me tell you a story. Some years ago, I was, I was listening to a random playlist on, on, Spotify, on Spotify, a random worship playlist on Spotify, and this song came up, 
uh, that I hadn't heard before and, and it caught my attention. So I stopped what I was doing and I, I restarted the song and I closed my eyes and I began to listen closely to the song. And it's a song called Clear the Stage by Jimmy Needham. And it struck me because the, the very first line of the song says this, clear the stage and set the sound and lights ablaze if that's the measure you must take to crush the idols. And it struck me because I'm like, dude, this boy is talking about lighting a church on fire. What kind of playlist did I stumble upon here? And I began to realize that he was talking about in his own heart, the platform had become an idol for him. The platform had become an idol for him. And so he began to sing and write this song and say, I need to sacrifice the idols because I need to follow Jesus and he needs to be God and God alone in my life. And the, the song went on and as he began to sing the bridge of the song, I began to have my very own moment with God because he's saying these words. He said, anything that I put before my God is an idol. Anything I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all of my heart is an idol. Anything that I can't stop thinking of is an idol. And anything or anyone that I give all of my love is an idol. And in that moment, I felt the overwhelming presence of God pointing out the places in my life where there are people whom I've put before God where there were, things, uh, there were things that I wanted with all of my heart, that there were people and things that I couldn't stop, get, uh, couldn't stop thinking of, that I was giving all of my love and all of my affection to people, and, and I was being covetous over material things. In other words, I had allowed idolatry to become a reality in my life. I'd slipped into idolatry. And you may be here this morning just like me, You've never erected a statue in your front lawn to worship. You haven't set up a shrine in your house of worship to worship. You, maybe you've never uh, even considered idolatry as a problem, but as time has gone on and your pursuit of comfort has paralleled your daily life, there may be things that have taken the place in your life that only God is supposed to occupy. And so this morning, we're going to sacrifice the idols. You can turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, because this is where God tells us about idolatry. We know that this is Exodus. These are the Ten Commandments. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. And we know that uh, God has saved his people. He's brought them out of slavery, the 400 years of slavery that they were in in Egypt, where they were becoming accustomed to Egypt's gods, where they were uh, uh, becoming accustomed to life in Egypt. And God leads them out of slavery, sets them free, leads them through the wilderness, and brings them to Mount Sinai. And then we get Moses having a conversation with the Lord. And God says this in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. He said, God gave all the people these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but... I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. I think sometimes we struggle with this part in here where it says, uh, 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 I am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. And we tend to think, man, God is just a God of rules, right? People who don't know Jesus, that's what they say. God is just a God of rules. It's just a, a list of do's and don'ts when I become a Christian. It's just taking all the fun out of my life. But here's the truth that I want you to write down this morning if you're taking notes because note takers are world changers. God isn't trying to keep us from fun. God is trying to keep us from death. God isn't trying to keep us from fun. God is trying to keep us from death. 
Jesus says in John 10, 10, that anyone who chooses to follow him to enter into his life will receive life and life abundantly, or as the New Living Translation puts it, a rich and satisfying life. And here's the truth. That doesn't mean that you'll become rich by human means. It means that you'll be rich by eternal means, which means that you will have life in the presence of God. And this is the life that never ends. Jesus also says in John 14, 6, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he is the only way to the Father. And, and that means that any other path of life is a life that leads to death. If Jesus is the only way to life, then any other path of life is a life that is disobedient to Jesus, even if it makes you happy here on earth. Even if it makes you, quote unquote, successful here on earth. Even if by the world's standards, you're living the good life. If it's a life apart from the will of Jesus, if it's a life apart from the plan of God for you, friends, it's a life that's gonna lead you to eternal death. So this morning, that life that, that is apart from Jesus, it's an eternal death, it, and it's eternal death in hell, where the only thing that you can be sure of is this. It's a life, it's an eternity of eternal torment separated from the presence of God. And so this morning, church, I ask, can we take an honest assessment of ourselves and ask, what are my idols? What are the things that take up all of our time, all of our energy, all of our focus? What are the things that are sitting in the place in our lives that only God is supposed to occupy? What are our idols? Maybe for some of us, there's a sin. There's a sin that we can't get over. There's a sin that we're struggling with. There's a sin that's keeping us chained. There's a sin that's keeping us bound. There's a sin that's keeping us down and separated from God. And it's an idol that we need to sacrifice this morning. Maybe for some of us, it's our phones, right? Man, sometimes I just want to take a hammer to my smartphone. You know what I'm saying? And for some of us, maybe our phone is what's consuming all of our time. Our phone is what's consuming all of our energy. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's people in your life. Maybe it's the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of things, the pursuit of happiness. But let's be honest, sometimes the things that we've idolized, the things that we've made idols in our lives aren't bad things. Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's our job. Hold on, Pastor August. Hold on. I love my family. I'm loyal to my family. My family needs to know that I love them. I sacrifice for my family. That's who I'm called to be. But remember what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. He says, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or your daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Do you know what that means? That means not only are you not supposed to be in charge of your own life, God is. That means not, you're not supposed to be in charge of your own family. You can trust them to God. And when we choose our family, our father or our mother, our brothers, our sisters, our sons, our daughters, our, our nieces, our nephews, our grandkids, when we choose those things instead of God, when we sacrifice our time with God, when we sacrifice our relationship with God, when we sacrifice even maybe meeting together on Sundays for our families, what we're saying is, God, I can't trust you with them, so I have to take control. And because I have to take control, because I can't trust you now, I'm worshiping my family. I'm idolizing. My, my family is sitting on the throne in my heart instead of you. And that's a hard command. 
That's a hard command, but let me tell you something this morning. Jesus is more trustworthy with your family than you are. Jesus is more trustworthy with your life than you are. Jesus created you. Jesus has a plan. Jesus has a purpose for you. You can trust him. You can surrender the idols. You can sacrifice the idols. You can give it all to Jesus. And you can trust that he is good and he loves you and he cares about you. And he has the best plan in store for your life if you would just choose to follow him in obedience. So right now, before we move forward, can we just pause? Can I have everybody close your eyes? And let's just take a moment in silence. Asking God to reveal to us who are the people, who are the things that have taken his spot in our lives that have become idols for us. Who are the people, what are the things that are taking all of our attention, taking all of our focus, all of our affection, all of our love? Who are the people, what are the things that are sitting on the throne of our hearts where God is supposed to sit. Holy Spirit, would you speak this morning? I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing to us those things, those people that have become idols for us. And here in just a few moments, I wanna remind you, I'm gonna open these altars and I'm gonna give you the opportunity to give them over to Jesus, to sacrifice the idols in your life so that Jesus can sit on the throne, so that you can pursue holiness so that you can be holy as God is holy this morning. Church, are you with me? Would you say yes? Come on, are you with me? Say yes. All right. We slip into idolatry when we lose sight about who God is and what God has done. And being busy makes this super easy. Being busy gives us an easy excuse. I'm too busy to spend time with God. I've got these, I got this list of a thousand things that I need to get done today. And so what falls off the list is the time with God when in reality, all the other things need to be scheduled around our time with the Lord, our relationship with Jesus. Busyness makes it super easy to lose sight about who God is and what God has done. And so to kill idolatry in our lives, we have to choose to be spiritually disciplined and keep our eyes and our hearts focused on him. So how do we do that, Pastor August? Great question. Like I said, God doesn't give us a command without giving us the tools to be able to fulfill it. And so I believe that he's given us three ways to kill idolatry in our lives and keep our eyes and our hearts focused on him and what he's called us to do and who he's created us to be and how he's called us to live. And way number one is this, we have to know his word. We have to know his word. That means that we have to have a daily routine of Bible reading and memorization. We have to have a daily routine of Bible reading and memory. Pastor August, I can't do it every single day of the week. Yeah, but do you drink water every day, every single day of the week? Some of you are like, nah, man, I drink Mountain Dew. Praise God. I'm with you. I understand. You should probably start drinking water, right? Do you eat every single day of the week? Do you talk to your spouse or your kids every single day of the week? If you, do you, come on, let's be honest. Do we watch the news every single day of the week? Do we... Some of y'all are old school. Do we read the newspaper every single day of the week? Come on, if you can find time to do the things that you enjoy, you can find time for God. You can find time to know his word, to have a daily routine of Bible reading and memorization. 
If God is going to be our true one and only God, we have to have an intimate relationship with him. And an intimate relationship means knowing his word. Because when you don't know God's word, it's easy for the enemy to come to you sounding like God, but in reality, he's taking the truth and twisting it to persuade you to follow him. This is exactly what happened in the garden. Remember, the serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say? Come on, but God is good. God wants you to be happy. Are you sure that he said it's not okay to eat the fruit? Because if you eat that fruit, you're going to be happy. Are you sure that's what God said? I don't think he would say that. Because eating that fruit is... It's going to fulfill your life. You're going to get knowledge. You're going to get all this stuff. It's going to make your life so much better. I think you might just be confused on what God said. He twists the word to convince us that he knows best. When in reality, all he's trying to do is kill us. All he's trying to do is steal us out of the hand of our creator. All he's trying to do is destroy our lives. When Jesus was tempted in the same way, he fought temptation and he overcame it with scripture. Do you realize, this is homework, y'all, congratulations, we're in the middle of summer and you're getting homework. Go home and read through the accounts of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Because the devil comes to him and every time he says, it is written, that means that he knows the word. That means that he's using the word of God to pull you away from God. But how did Jesus combat it? Combat? Combat. Yeah, that's it. That's the word. That's the one I was looking for. How did Jesus uh, overcome temptation? He responded with, it is also written. You might know the word, but I have an understanding of the word. That's the difference. You might know the word, but I have an understanding of the word. And I know you're quoting it to me, but what you fail to realize is I also know, it's also in my head, it's also in my heart, it is also written that you shall not put your God to the test. Come on. You have to have an intimate relationship with God, knowing his word. And Jesus' intimate and close relationship with his father and his spirit living inside of him gave him the power and the ability to use the word of God as a defense against Satan. It's easy to write it off because they say, well, Jesus was the son of God, Pastor August. Aren't we co-heirs with Christ? Aren't we children of God? Didn't Jesus give up his divinity in heaven to come down fully human and fully man? Wasn't he anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism just like we are? If Jesus can do it, so can we. Why? Because he's given us his spirit to live inside of us. He's given us his power to live inside of us and to operate inside of us and to operate through us. It's the same spirit of God that rose Jesus from the dead that lives inside of us and so we can overcome temptation. But it only comes through having an intimate relationship with God and knowing his word. Number two, the second way that we kill idolatry in our lives is is we have to live in his presence. We have to live in his presence. What does that mean? That means that we have to have a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of prayer. Here's why, you have to be able to distinguish between the voices of chaos and the voice of your father. You have to be able to distinguish between the voice of chaos, all the, all the voices around you that are telling you what to do and how to live, the talking heads on the TV, the talking heads at work, all of the people around you that are telling you this is how you should live, this is what you should do, this is it, this is the way to go, this is the path to success, this is what you need to be doing with your life. You have to be able to distinguish between their voices and the voice of the Father who created you. And the only way to do that is living a lifestyle of prayer. Why? Here's another truth you should write down. Because prayer softens our hearts to his voice and his leading. Prayer softens our hearts to his voice. It's harder to slip into idolatry when you're aware of and listening for the voice 
of God. I have an intimate relationship with my wife and I know her voice anywhere we are. Her voice will always be able to pierce through the crowd. Her voice, no matter what else is going on around me, and we've been in some chaotic moments because her and I were youth pastors for six years, okay? And I've been with I've camp, convention, all the stuff with teenagers. But no matter where we were, when I heard her say my name, I knew that's my wife and I need to go to her. We have to have that same kind of intimate relationship with God and be so in tune with his voice that when we're struggling with, whatever, with what the world is saying and when we're hearing what the world is telling us and how they're telling us to live, we have to be able to hear the voice of God say, no, that's not what I called you to. No, that's not where I'm leading you. And we know the story of Elijah on the mountain, right? The storm came, the earthquake, the thunder rolled, the lightning came. There was a fire that set everything ablaze, but God wasn't in any of it. Where did Elijah hear his voice? He heard it in the still, small whisper. His relationship with God was so intimate and close that he wasn't shaken by the stuff. He wasn't confused by the stuff. He heard God's voice. He was in tune with God's voice. Church, we have to be in tune, so in tune with God's voice that as we're in the crowd, his voice can pierce through the chaos and we can hear him speaking to us and leading us. The same principle applies to knowing the Holy Spirit and his guidance in your life. When we spend time in prayer, abiding in the presence of God, you learn the character of God and you learn the nuances of how he leads you. So as you're living your life, you have knowledge of how Jesus is asking you to live and you have the ability to follow his spirit. When you have a lifestyle of prayer, you can be confronted with things that the enemy is trying to lead you astray with. But because you have a lifestyle of prayer, you can already know without having to go back to your prayer closet, right? Man, I'm confronted with this thing. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I need to pray. I need to go pray about it. I need to spend time in prayer because I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. No, 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 no. When you live a lifestyle of prayer, you can be confronted with things that look really good, but it's from the enemy. And you can already know that's not what God's called me to do. I know him. I know him personally. I have a testimony. I've had an encounter with Jesus and I know beyond a shadow of doubt who he's called me to be and that ain't it. That only comes from a lifestyle of prayer. That only comes from a a heart that's softened to his voice and his leading. When you live a prayerful life, you'll live a life without idols. The last way, the third way that we kill idolatry in our lives is we develop a desire for him. We develop a desire for him. What that means is we have to have a routine of fasting. This is the hardest spiritual discipline, especially for me. So I love steak and mashed potatoes. This is the hardest spiritual discipline, but in my opinion, this is one of the most important, and it needs to happen more than just once a year. Doing it as a church once a year, man, that's great. That's a great start. That's a great way to start the year. But we have to have a personal routine of fasting. Why? Because here's the third truth for you to write down. When you fast, you repurpose your cravings for a desire for God. When you fast, you repurpose your cravings into a desire for God. The hardest three months of my life were at the beginning of this year, January, February, March. You want to know why? Because in those three months of my life, I gave up soda pop. It was difficult. And every time, it was extremely hard and difficult, but for those three months, every time I had a craving for the sweet nectar of Mountain Dew, I had to stop. I had to take an intentional moment to say, it might taste good, but it's not what's best for me. It's not what's best for me. 
water is what's best for me. So I have to choose water. Water is what's best for me, so I have to choose water. The same principle applies to God's presence. Fasting gives us the opportunity to practice making hard decisions. Fasting deepens our desire for the first two spiritual disciplines. When we give up that time, when we give up that thing that we're normally doing, we choose to instead take that time to intentionally be with Jesus. We're deepening our faith in Jesus. And therefore, we're stepping farther into the life that he created us to live. Fasting produces character in us that makes taking up our cross and denying ourselves a reality. Church, this is an all or nothing kind of faith. It's all or nothing. We either give it all to Jesus or this life amounts to nothing. We either live in obedience, total surrender to Jesus, or this life amounts to nothing. And this morning my prayer is that none of us would live with hearts that are far from him. None of us would live with idols. None of us would live with hearts that are far from Jesus. So my challenge to you this morning is simply this. Will you sacrifice the idols of your life so that God can reign and Jesus can sit in his rightful place on the throne of your hearts? Will you sacrifice your idols? Pastor Brandon Cormier at a live conference 2020, he said something that has stayed with me ever since I heard it. He said this, there are two places in every person's life One is occupied by you, and the other is occupied by Jesus. Place number one is a cross. Place number two is a throne. So what that means is if you are sitting on the throne of your life, then Jesus is occupying the cross and is in effect dead in your life. But if Jesus is on the throne of your life, which is where he's supposed to be, then you are in the rightful place. Excuse me, then you are in your rightful place which is on the cross. That is what is called dying to yourself so that Jesus can live in you. Dying to yourself so that Jesus can live in you. Will you stand with me this morning? This morning I ask, who is on the throne of your life? Is it you or is it Jesus? If it's you, then this needs to be your moment of surrender. You on the throne can look a multitude of different different ways. Maybe it's you and the stuff you have that's become an idol. Maybe it's you and the wealth that you're striving to acquire that's become the idol. The version of you that is consumed with pleasing people, trying to make sure that the people around you uh, uh, like you, they wanna be with you, they care about you. The version of you that is still chained down and, and locked up with sin, maybe that's the version of you that's on the throne. Maybe it's you and the the minor things, the stuff that you've elevated past where they're supposed to be. Who is on the throne of your life? Remember Pastor Jeff's challenge last week. If there's something that you can't part with, maybe you need to talk to Jesus about it because that thing has probably become an idol. So my final question to you this morning is this. Will you sacrifice the idols? Will you choose a spiritually disciplined life? If you're saying yes, I will. That's me. Then show it. Prove to yourself that you're willing to make the hard decisions. Step out of your comfort zone. Respond to Jesus at the altar. No coercion, no fancy speech, no bribing. It's your choice this morning. I'm going to pray, we're going to sing, you choose to respond. Jesus, I pray that we would be people who sacrifice our idols. I pray that we would be people who choose to live in obedience to you. I pray that we would be people who are on the cross of our lives so that you can be in your rightful place, which is on the throne. God, I pray that we would be people of character and people of integrity, God, who follows after you. Lord, I pray that every heart in this place, that every person in this place would sacrifice the idols. Jesus, speak to us this morning.